Uh, thank, thank you, Raj, for that introduction. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my first thanks go to Norman Borlaug, who gave me my first job, actually, when I came here to Simmet in 1970, and who had a huge influence on my career ever since. Thank you also to the organisers for having the courage to invite such an old fart as me to speak on a subject, admittedly a subject of which I've been interested in all of my life. It's not on the screen here. It's okay. Right. There is my subject. It's a very big subject, so I'm have, going to have to move rather superficially across it. Uh, it has been occupying me the last couple of years writing a book about this. And let's see if I can get to a, a balanced impression of what I think is happening in wheat yield. My talk is divided into for those four parts there, a methodology for looking at yield, some case studies, a summary of the situation as I see it for wheat around the world, and then something on wheat yield prospects. It's okay. So this is what it's all about. We've seen this figure for wheat yield, global wheat yield over the last 20 years. The slope is there, the predicted yield 2012 is 3.1 tons per hectare. It's linear, it's not exponential, it's not curvilinear, it's incredibly linear. And the best way to understand that slope is to express it relative to the yield in 2012, a 1% per annum increase in yield. And I'll use that approach as we disaggregate this because of course we can't say anything about that until we disaggregate into countries, into regions and try and look at the factors beneath this progress to see if we can guess where we may be heading in the next 20 to 40 years, the period of great importance for feeding the world. Uh, some time ago, a couple of young guys in the Simmet Wheat Program, Fisher and Wall, actually managed to produce a paper, notwithstanding the discussion we had yesterday about Norm Borlaug and publications. This came out in 1976. We looked at the wheat progress in the Yaki Valley up to 1975. We've both been working here. And there it is. It's quite spectacular. It may be hard for you to read. It's 266 kilograms per hectare per day progress in farm yield across the Yaki Valley. That's actually 6% progress expressed relative to the 1975 yield. We also grew all those varieties in uh, plots at Siano at the experiment station under the best agronomy. And we've plotted their yields under those conditions, those yields, we call them potential yields, and we've plotted them against the year of release. Please remember that. Potential yield is plotted against the year of release grown under the latest best agronomy. And we could see that at least some of that farm yield progress must be due to varieties. If you look at it in a relative sense, maybe only a fraction of it. We were also able to get hold of what's happened to nitrogen rates on farms over that period. And we concluded that, well, what we're seeing at the farm level is a combination of the breeding progress and the application of nitrogen and the interaction between these two components. Thank you. Of course, we're all interested in the rest of the, the, the following 40 years in the Yaki Valley, and that's what happened. Now it's gone from one ton to almost seven tons. And let's look a little bit more closely in the last 30 years. That gives us more an idea of what might be happening in the future. So I've taken 30 years because it's actually quite variable from year to year, the, the uh, farm yield in the Yaki Valley. To get a good handle on slope, we look like we're doing about 0.9% per annum now at farm yield in the valley. That's, that's uh, the 180,000 hectares of wheat, irrigated wheat every year. Uh, the same information from the variety trials on the station under the best management. It looks like this, and instead of putting a step function on it, I just put a line straight through it. That's bread wheats and durum wheats, again plotted against the year of release. Now, I'm missing some of the most recent releases, but I do have seal and all there. That's the very highest point on that graph. And that rate of progress is only about 3% of the potential yield in 2012. 0.3%. Uh, we can do some other things. We can talk about a yield gap. 
about 41% there. That yield gap is always in this presentation expressed as a percentage of the farm yield. It makes more sense to present it that way. It, uh, we don't have time to go into it much more. It looks like the yield gap's closing a little bit over that period. Uh, part of that may be related to this story. Nitrogen rate has continued to go up and has it's reached unnecessarily high levels, but that's another story and you heard a little bit about that at the field day. When we look at what might be causing the yield gap, there's been a number of excellent surveys of the valley and now excellent papers using satellite imagery to understand yield variation between fields in the valley. Certainly it's not lack of nitrogen causing this gap, but there are small constraints have been identified, late, late planting in some seasons, uh, late watering after planting in other situations, and in fact it turns out from the satellite work, those fallow fields that had more weeds had lower wheat yields following that period of fallow. Uh, it's not a big gap by any standards, 41%. So let's summarize this approach to yield in, e in any particular situation. In essence, the approach views farm yield as potential yield less the yield gap. Bearing in mind that the yield gap's unlikely to ever be less than 30% of farm yield, or farm yield unlikely to be more than, say, 77% of potential yield, because it doesn't make economic sense for a risk averse farmer to push for those very high yields, unless he's received sub subsidized prices. But if we have larger gaps, then we have what we call an exploitable gap, a gap which farmers under normal world economics should be able to exploit. Um, the other thing I'd say is we need to note that the farm yield progress is the rate of farm yield change is therefore the rate of potential yield change less the change in yield gap. Uh, and some finer points that might help you understand what I go on to do with some other situations now. The gap and the gap change are determined by difference. We don't have a direct way of measuring it otherwise. The relative progress in potential yield is measured, as I've said several times already, against the year of release with the latest agronomy. And this is assumed to translate into the same relative progress in farm yield upon full adoption of the technologies measured in the potential yield progress. And you, if you have time later, you can think about that. It also means that the potential yield progress contains, it captures any of these important positive interactions between genetic improvement and agronomic change because the potential yield is measured at the most recent agronomy, the most modern agronomy. It's very important in these studies to avoid bias from, for example, having more de disease in the older varieties in your study. That's a common error around in the literature. And it's very important that the potential yield be measured in an environment which is representative of the natural resource base of the region you're interested in, represented in terms of climate and soil in particular. And, and it turns out that the experiment station where you went for the field trip uh, a couple of days ago is very well represented. In fact, it's somewhat less favored soil-wise than the valley. And for other reasons, quite representative. Okay, uh, I can't run through all of the examples that have been looked at in the, in the, in the book, but we went about weighting our sampling to some extent based on the important mega environments of wheat. This is something that Simit has had around now for almost 30 years, a way of looking at wheat in the world according to what are the key environmental factors in those environments. And I'll just point out four of them to you. The ME1, wheat mega environment one, the irrigated low latitude one, 70% of the world's wheat area. That is the Yaki Valley and all those other places I've mentioned. Another very important one, four, low to moderate rainfall, again low latitude, so spring wheat again, 15% of the world's wheat area. And one that people tend to neglect, mega environment six, low to moderate rainfall, high latitude. That's spring so on spring wheat. That's Canada and Siberia, and it's a big chunk of world's wheat. And finally, under winter wheats, the biggest one is 11, the high rainfall, middle latitude, winter wheat areas, particularly uh, Western Europe, Eastern United States. And that's, in fact, the biggest wheat area and certainly the biggest chunk of wheat production comes out of that mega environment. So this was the basis in which case studies were chosen. I'll just give you a couple more case studies before I show you a summary table of potential yield change and yield gap change. Uh, this is uh, Punjab in India, several million hectares grown in the Punjab. 
You can see farm yield is increasing statistically significantly, 0.7% per annum. Uh, it's hard to get this potential yield data, but the best I've got, I think, is about 0.4% uh, from the extensive breeding programs in that part of the world. And a yield gap, which is 56%, somewhat bigger than the Yaki Valley. And you might notice the yield potential is quite a bit less than the Yaki Valley. And we understand a bit about the climatic reasons why that has come about. Um, and the larger yield gap, there's more constraints in the ponds, and particularly on, on the water side of things, there's more constraints for farmers getting water when they need water. Won't say any more about Punjab, but it's a very important uh, uh, bellwether, if you like, for, for India's wheat production. Moving now quickly to Western Australia, we call this PYW, Potential Yield Water Limited, because it's a very dry, it's one of the driest wheat growing regions of the world, about, again, 4 million hectares of wheat. You see how, uh, how farm yield jumps up and down, that's simply because of the way the rains come, some very bad droughts through the night, through the, through in the last decade. But we can still measure a significant increase in yield at the farm level, about 1% per annum. And from the National Variety Trials, remember these are plotted against year of release. It, it's averaged over the last five or six years. They don't jump around. Uh, and they show breeding progress at about 0.5%. Towards reaching a potential of 2.6 tonnes versus farm yield 1.8. So not such a big gap there either. But some gap closing has obviously taken place in the last 30 years in this wheat environment. It shows that even in the toughest environments, science can make progress. And there's lots of things behind this. I'd just like to mention that cons conservation tillage has been a big factor and herbicides permitting earlier sowing and more moisture conservation. There's been a move towards more crop diversity with broadleaf crops coming in like the lupins, canola, pulse crops and somewhat more nitrogen, but we're still only talking about 20 to 30 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen in this very dry environment. The gap, it's interesting, is partly driven by risk aversion that you find in farmers all around the world who are growing uh, crops in dry rain-fed areas. My final example is uh, from the UK. Uh, this is very different. We've got an offset on the yield axis, you might notice, uh, but there is still Farm yield progress in the UK is very slow now. We reached about eight tonnes per hectare when I last, when I put these numbers together. They haven't exceeded it, unfortunately, since then. Uh, but, but somewhat better. Again, highly significant progress in potential yield, data that comes out of the Home Grown Cereal Authority trials, which happens to be uh, the best data set in the world when it comes to studying these things. The yield gap's quite small, almost close to the minimum gap that you might expect. Just a few things more about the UK. As I said, excellent data. They run uh, about 20 sites around England in farmers' fields with and without fungicide protection. So you can really get an idea of what's happening. It's recently been analyzed by Ian Mackay from NIAB, and he's applied linear mix model, modeling to it and uh, come up with another interesting observation from the data. And that is that, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going back on that. Potential yield. He's agronomy plus breeding, but he has not been able to find any influence of agronomy in the last 40 years, last 30 years, uh, in the potential yield in the trials grown with the best agronomy over that period. We seem to be running out of agro agronomic progress at the level of potential yield in the UK. Also, the yield gap's very small, and it's actually increasing. And if you go to France, it's much more obvious. Farm yield is not increasing at all in France, yet the breeders are continuing to make almost 1% progress in winter wheats in northern France. And amongst other things, it's regulations, it's European regulations on input use, which is holding back yield in France and in several other European countries. Not even mention Switzerland, which is really just a museum piece now. Uh, so let's summarize this. Uh, I've got the spring wheat ones there. I've mentioned all of those, except I didn't mention this one. This is an because it represents a very important mega environment six, the high latitude spring wheat. Uh, there are other examples that I haven't had time to mention, but you can see that North Dakota is doing uh, 
Yeah. 1% on farm yield, 0.7 on potential yield, and a bit of gap closing going on. Here are the winter wheat ones. I've added China because they got some very good data out of China. I've added Kansas. I wanted to talk about it because I know there's a lot of people here from the Great Plains but don't have time. Again, they're all doing fairly modestly on the breeding progress and a little bit of gap closing, except for the UK where the gap is getting bigger. So the important thing here is the average of all these cases, plus the other ones that weren't even mentioned in this table, a bit higher than world average yield, but I don't think this is biasing these other estimates. 48% progress on yield gap. Uh, I've got 10 minutes. 10 minutes, no? Uh, anyhow, this is the important figure, year progress, averaging about potential year progress 0.6% and some yep, coal closing. And we can put it on a mega environment basis and it looks uh, the important number for you there, it was still at 0.6, but gap closing is, is, is somewhat greater. I've told I've only got five minutes and I think uh, I'll have to move fairly quickly, so let, let's look at the prospects. First thing to note is that the breeding progress, the potential yield progress in wheat is actually less than these other crops, which is interesting. But there's no sign of a limit being approached, although it's becoming more difficult as Ravi Singh told us the other day in the field. New agronomy is part of potential yield progress, but um, the options are limited and there's a list of some of the areas where we might get some new agronomy lifting yield, lifting potential yield. The most interesting one might be this interaction down here for intermediate latitudes, because we could move to more productive earlier sowing if we could just improve the head frost resistance in wheat, and there is useful genetic variation. And I don't mean to say new agronomy has, other, has no other things to do, it's very important for resource use efficiency. Conventional breeding, still making steady progress, uh, new tools continue to develop to help efficiency, which is undoubtedly falling. These tools are mentioned here quite quickly. Some have been around for a while. These are newer ones. And of course, we have molecular markers. We're going to hear about genomic selection. I'm, frankly, I think that genomic selection could be revolutionary as an aid to yield breeding. Uh, and then there's the untapped wheat genetic diversity in the gene banks. We haven't even touched that. It's not easy to do, it'll be difficult and expensive, but we nearly get, get onto it. Finally, what about non-conventional breeding? We've heard about heterosis. I think it's going to happen in the next 20 years and there will be a yield jump. The other interesting thing is the private sector can and will likely play a much bigger role in this wheat breeding. Of course, they're interested in genetic engineering for yield potential, potential yield. I think it won't happen in 20 years or even 30 years, but I think the indirect benefits of molecular biology and freeing up breeding resources to focus more on yield uh, are, are, are the, the biggest benefits in this area. And, but can we expect to improve on the 0.6% progress? I don't think so, even with the private sector involved. I, I think that we'll would be lucky if we can keep it up. Closing the gap, the gaps for wheat are quite small relative to the other major staples. There they are there. Closing the gap means intensification on all the fronts. And this is fine because this is the path to more sustainable and more efficient systems, more efficient use of inputs per kilo of grain produced. That's the way to think about it. It's not per hectare, it's per kilo of grain produced. Um, it's the role of extension gap closing, but research can help with gap closing. In particular, I'll just touch on one thing here. That's breeding for better resistance because we're still losing because of diseases and insects and pests in farmers' fields. There's things agronomy can do to help with gap closing. Just one example is here. Uh, taking better, whoops, sorry. So let's summarize. That's what I think we can do on potential yield. That's what I can think we can continue to do on gap closing. Can't do much better. I do mention climate change. I think it cancels out the CO2 effect and the temperature effect are going to cancel out. It's zero. Haven't had much time to talk about this, but I think wheat will gradually be pushed out of the irrigated areas of the developed world. So we're going to struggle to do 1%. And what about 1%? Most estimates said that's not nearly enough to meet demand growth, especially in the next 20 years. The equilibrium modeling suggests with only 1% yield growth, we're going to have higher real wheat prices relative to 2010, greater stress for poor wheat consumers, larger wheat area but rain-fed, and greater trade in wheat. 
results of going to be responsive to investment in RDNE, but the elasticity is quite uncertain and quite low. And also the efficiency of RDNE around the world, I think, is a big issue. And finally, there are these other rural investments, roads, education, the things we heard from Perpich to Anderson yesterday that are often unnecessary and not sufficient condition in developing countries if we're going to move things faster than the moment. So my bottom line is this, if we can attend to all of these things, the, wor the world might scrape by on wheat, scrape by. But the prospect of more urban price-driven crises remains higher with wheat than with any of the other staples. Thank you uh, for your attention. And I'd like to also acknowledge, no way, all the people who have helped me and uh, responded to my emails over the years as I've pulled together this database. Uh, I'd also like to say, if you want to know more about this, there's 70 pages about wheat in, in a book that myself, Derek Bailey, and Greg Edmonds have just, just produced. And there's 500 pages on all the other crops, if you're interested. So please come by the, the uh, poster and have a look at it. See, see, see what you think. Um, uh, thank you very much uh, for your kind attention. I think the, the, all three speakers were great this morning, and let us give them very big hands. Uh, I am assuming that there is no announcement, so, so Hans said no. So I think we are ready for the coffee break. Thank you very much. <laughs>